Welcome to News Click. While we discuss the situation in Kashmir from uh, highlighting a variety of issues which concerns judiciary, restrictions, communication and all, there is one area that has received very little attention uh, until uh, an article appeared in Kashmir Times written by Dr. Shobhna Sonpar. Dr. Shobhna Sompar, who's with us today, uh, is a clinic, a practicing clinical psychologist and a psychotherapist. She has helped in setting up IIT Delhi's counseling services. Uh, she has helped prepare the curriculum for Tribhuvan University for their uh, psychology program. Uh, but for us, it's very interesting to know that she has also done in the last two decades, a lot of work in Kashmir and on Kashmir related to people in Kashmir and the issues concerning that. She's been part of many workshops. She's conducted many workshops. Apart from that, she's done a detailed study of psychological study of ex-militants. Welcome to News Clicks, Shobhna. Thank you. Shobhna, let me begin by asking, uh, in this the only piece that, has, that we have noticed in recent times, after all the turbulence that uh, people are experiencing in Kashmir that has come on the mental health situation of the people, appeared in Kashmir Times, where actually you draw attention to a very serious uh, issues. You refer in that article to a 2015 study by Doctors Without Frontiers and the Department of Psychology of Kashmir University, which claims that up to 45% of the adult population, that is nearly 2 million adults in Kashmir, suffer from some psychological, psychological problem, stress. I'd like you to elaborate on that. And uh, what does it mean when you already have such an existing situation? What does it mean then to subject the same people to even greater amount of restrictions or rather repression? Let's call, call it what it is. But first, let's um, underline the enormity of the mental health problem. The 2015 study that you referred to was conducted jointly by Doctors Without Borders, Psychology Department of uh, Kashmir University, and the Institute of Mental Health in Srinagar. Okay. Yeah, all three of them collaborated in this, and it's an extensive study covering 10 districts of the Kashmir Valley. Uh, I think about 5,600 households were covered, and um, uh, they did random sampling, so it's a, uh, a status, um, uh, methodologically, it's a very rigorous study. And the findings uh, are really alarming because to say that 45% of your adult population is suffering psychological distress, of which nearly 20% are suffering from uh, what could be post-traumatic stress disorder, um, about 35% or so are anxiety related and um, about 41% are suffering from depression. This is a very serious thing. It's half the population, no? Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, uh, I think the significant thing here is that they have attempted to, um, uh, to also correlate it with trauma. Uh, by actually studying how many traumatic events have these people also suffered. Mm -hmm. So there's a clear linkage between really? the fact that uh, whatever they are suffering, the mental distress, mm -hmm. is not just some individual phenomena, you know, that happens, you know, people suffer from. Mm -hmm. But it's really related to uh, traumatic psychosocial context. So that's a very what important... What does it mean? I mean, for an ordinary person, uh, this is like this is like Greek. How? What does it mean? Uh, it means that these people have gone through life events that are extreme, uh, where their survival may be uh, threatened, uh, which have evoked extreme fear, extreme helplessness, and repeated that, such traumatic and repeated events. such events. Yeah. 
So um, uh, when they have uh, assessed how many um, such traumatic events these people may have faced, it's like about 7.5 per, which is very, very high in that context. What is an average that um, as a clinical psychologist I, I don't know what the exact thing it is, but it is much less. It's probably, you know, in the region of one or two. I mean, where do you have uh, so many traumatic life events happening, no? And that also which push you into extremes of emotion, especially emotions of fear and lack of safety. Mm. No? They're life-threatening. Yeah. Uh, either actually physical life or your psychological life, you know? Given that people were already subjected to, I mean, they, ex they were experiencing yeah. this yeah. Uh, in the course of the last 30 years. Yeah. When you inflict on the same population, yeah. even a greater regime of control and, and uh, victimization, yeah. so to say, yeah. what happens to them then? Um, I mean, if you're already sick mm. and you're suffering, you're down, what happens then if it's if you're the traumatic experience so there is no experience of um, normality no mm. so um, speaking as a, 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 a person who actually does psychotherapy for a living one of the things that i find is that when people are suffering from some anxiety some fearfulness their capacity to reflect goes mm. because you're only in survival mode so your actions and decisions, you know, that lead to what shall I do, are not governed by a reflective uh, capacity to go in the line of most constructive action. They are sometimes simply out of that emotional uh, motivation of uh, w w that is happening at that mm. particular time. Mm. Um, so one of the things that can happen is actually um, uh, two extremes. One is a, a, a complete um, uh, cowering into complete silence and subjugation, but uh, underneath the silence and subjugation would be a lot of other stuff simmering. So you have, uh, like you know, when you you look at pop populations in captivity. You know, and um, the 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 qualities of populations in captivity, whether it's prisoners, whether it is psychological captivity, like you have a battered uh, 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 a situation of domestic abuse and a battered woman, or you have a sexually abusive situation. So across all, is a sense of there is coercive control and subjugation and a great fear. No, um, and that situation uh, creates a, a kind of a, a both a constraint, but uh, so there is a um, there is a maybe uh, what is manifest is quietness and silence and lack of protest and even maybe in order to survive a kind of a bartering, mm -hmm. no. Uh, no, but underneath that, there is always something that's similar. So there will be outbursts of one kind or the other. So what are the implications then? You refer to outbursts. So the implications what you are, in your article, in fact, you yeah. refer to something even more. So the implications are really of uh, the prospect of uh, more violence at some point. It cannot but be so because where are all those feelings of... Um, of, of terror, uh, which is now coupled with humiliation and subjugation and shame, yeah, and helplessness. Uh, where is that going to go? It can, it it will, it may be um, uh, suppressed for a while, but uh, it will, it will emerge in some form or the other. So you fear that there would be a rise in violence and of a... Uh, I, I think there is likely to be, you know, and um, I think one of the things that I also draw attention to in my piece is that this kind of a context, um, it actually destroys 
something that we all take for granted mm. in terms of uh, what is it that makes me feel secure, for instance, no? at a very implicit background level. It's simply that I don't think that my people around me are out to harm me. I think that I can, you know, trust on the goodwill of the fellow here and, you know, I mean, and we take this so much work. for granted. Yeah. We take so much for granted this implicit sense of trust and goodwill. This is just not there in these contexts, it's destroyed. So you have a people who, uh, who become distrustful and suspicious and they have reason to be. Right? Watchful, vigilant, uh, constantly feeling under threat. No? And this is a result of yes. the, the, the control of, and the captivity of, uh, yeah, of kind yeah. that is they are being subjected to. Yeah, yeah. One question that startles me and I think bothering me also is that mental health, it's not as if mental health issue in Kashmir has not been flagged earlier. Mm. It has been. What I find very uh, disturbing is the fact that it hasn't received in the present context where we are in the 47 day of uh, restrict, uh, restrictions. Um, there is no concern for the mental, what, what happens to people when they're subjected to this level of, of control. So Gautam, um, you know, there's a, it's a two-edged sword is what I think. Mm. I think on one hand, uh, when you draw attention to mental health mm. and you begin to talk about it in terms of PTSD and clinical depression and anxiety, you move into a health yeah, health frame. issue. Yeah. It becomes a medical problem yeah. and it loses the fact that this suffering is anchored in their socio-political reality. So now it becomes a matter for psychologists to go and concern themselves with mm. and counsellors. Mm. It should not. Mm. I mean, they, the counsellors are only addressing uh, the, they're only dressing the wounds. No, mm. no. It's the rest of society that has to look at the social suffering in which they are complicit. Mm. No. Uh, so, so that's why I say it's double-edged because when you give it that mental health and of course the other thing that I want to emphasize is that when you look at the it's causing this kind of mental health problem actually that's only the tip of the iceberg because the damage that is being done to the young people who have not the children for instance they're going about playing and doing this that and the other and you say oh how resilient and so on but what is it actually doing to them and what is going to be the long term in fact uh, when you talk about trauma now uh, the conversation about trauma in in uh, professional circles is a distinction between what they call developmental trauma which is what happens with children who have suffered adversity of any kind and adult onset trauma which is you know I go through a tsunami or I have an accident so right it, the, there is the impact is very different because for uh, for children the trauma impacts their very development because they're not fully formed. So it enters there, they embody the trauma in their whole development. They, their ways of developing and becoming people uh, carry ways of coping with extremity. So they develop also. No? So this is what we see all the time when we deal with adult patients who have actually suffered, say, sexual abuse, physical abuse, or neglect, or any other form of long-term childhood adversity, uh, right? So we are not looking at that because they are not no, falling so what, into your little categories. No, so you are trying to say that the reason, I mean, uh, they need not be too much of focus on mental health because it will distract. I think the, yeah, I think the focus on mental health has to broaden outside just psychiatric diagnosis which only um, uh, identify the tip of the iceberg but the kind of psychological damage that is happening mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to society as a whole and to various uh, sections of that society mm. uh, they don't fall into clear-cut psychiatric diagnosis so 
that's again a problem of looking at it through a strict mm. mental health model. I would look at it more in terms of a psychological, psychosocial well-being model. And actually the psychosocial well-being model is a model that now increasingly people who work in areas where there is being long-term uh, long, long conflict, Kashmir, Kashmir ho, yeah, even if there not is... Not that it has helped much because mm. the, the conditions have remained or rather deteriorated. Yeah. So the level of restrictions and the level of, of, I mean, subjecting them to a greater restrictions of variety of, of various forms has yeah. been a part of their life. But there is one thing that strikes me. I mean, while what, uh, mm. it's interesting what you have said, because that's, that's important to keep in mind so that the, the real issues don't get sidetracked. How is it? I mean, you have written elsewhere too that about two things that I want to flag, that people make a distinct, uh, there is in all, in most of the studies or your encounters at a popular level, you found that people were not necessarily talking in the, uh, in the bipolar language of violence versus non-violence, but they were more inclined towards legitimate mm. good violence versus illegitimate mm. bad violence. Mm. Keeping this distinction in mind, and also what you said in the introduction to the book that you and Nehru Kanwar uh, have brought out on, in memory of uh, Dr. Vimla Lal. Mm. Uh, you make a very important point there also about prejudice, that it's, it's where the others, mm. a person belonging to another social group, ceases to be a person. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how I read it, that mm. it ceases to be a person and therefore, when legitimate violence is applied against somebody mm. who's already yeah. seen as an adversary yeah. or a suspicious character yeah. or an enemy, yeah. then yeah. everything goes. Yeah. My question is this. Right now, the kind of cruel apathy and indifference that is being displayed, where people accept that, yes, what is being done to Kashmir is mm. uh, all right. It's only in their best interest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, that's the best case scenario that they paint. But what does it say about those who themselves mm. remain so cruelly indifferent to conditions which you and I would not find acceptable even for 24 hours. Here they have been subjected for 30 years and at the end of it now they have been made captive. Entire, it's not just one or two or three or hundred individuals, it's an entire people. What does it say about ourselves? So this is really entering into very complicated territory and it's an area I think where a lot more research has be, to be done and has not been done which is uh, actually of um, how is it that we um, um, uh, numb ourselves to the suffering of others. Uh, yeah, psychologists there is no compassion. Speak, there psychologists is no speak of it often in terms of uh, one uh, mechanism, which is that of dissociation. Right? Uh, dissociation, we all do dissociation. I do dissociation, for instance, when I'm at the traffic light and a little kid comes begging for money or whatever. Right? Yeah, but when this I say we are no. talking about no, a staggering. No. But we yeah. need to consider that these are uh, processes that we all utilize. And um, some people utilize it more in certain situations, but the mechanisms are similar. I just want to highlight the fact that there is a way in which dissociation is a normal human faculty to ward off, um, to ward off what we can't bear to see. Okay? Yeah, uh, here the is the reverse. Here, but the, yeah. So here the question is, how are you warding off uh, what is staring you in the face? One is that you're not looking at it. How many people have read this article? Uh, let me share with you that I shared um, uh, some thoughts on a psychologist forum, uh, right? Uh, about um, uh, mental health. And it was in the context of this very study that we speak of. This 
radio silence. Nobody responded. So one way of dissociating is simply denial. I turn my head away because I can't, I cannot deal with it. No, I don't here want to the case is different. It's not just denial. It's much more than that. It's step beyond mm -hmm. where they endorse what is being done. Okay, there is so, popular support. So, so, so suppose. And so that, here that we shows get, a like, level of right. cruelty. Hmm. And you remarked also somewhere else in your in your one of your studies yeah. about the authoritarian personality. Yeah, uh, I think that among gets, those who yeah. have very prejudice, yeah. strong prejudice, yeah. display a strong authoritarian personality. So is it that that is that we are revealed? I mean, that is is that what is being revealed about us? I, I, don't, I don't think one can make a generalization. So I think surely, as in all societies, there will be some among us who have strong authoritarian personalities and some who don't. But the, I think what we are looking at here, and maybe it's a more useful way of looking at it, is the dynamics of bystanders. You know, uh, bystanders in any context. What is it that makes bystanders not intervene or not pay attention? Uh, so dissociation is one of them. Uh, the other is that if in some ways you feel that you have... Um, no, you, let's get... That one oh, yeah. If you feel that you have... Um, uh, you are in some way complicit simply by the fact that I, I identify with this group to which I belong. So I belong to this community, right? Uh, this is the community that is propagating this, right? Right? Somewhere my, we, that I, I belong to this larger collective uh, makes me conflicted. It makes me conflicted in the direction of, um, I, I, I feel terrible about what's happening, but how can I? Because I also feel ashamed and guilty, right? So here we come to where shame and guilt can either make a person move forward in a reparative mode, acknowledging complicity, seeking help, seeking redress and all of that, or make you move back into a further hardened, polarized position by making the defenses, the uh, dissociation, the denial stronger, and by blaming the victim, right? So this is, my this is question, the juncture. Yeah, I come back again to my question. Yeah. That still doesn't, how is it hmm. that the opinion makers and decision makers, despite 47 days of this, in a place where for 30 years people have been subjected to various uh, traumatic uh, experiences, a mm. series of it, mm. the Indian society that is claiming them mm. believes that all that is being done is all right. So here it's we have this. to make a distinction no? mm. between the people who are making the policy makers yes. and the people. Yes. Who, is, who is the audience for which the policy makers are doing what they're doing? They're not doing it for the Kashmiris. They're doing it for the rest. Of us. Yes. So here is where we need to understand. So when the leaders do this for their own agendas, yeah, whatever yeah. it might be, uh, what is it that the bystander, the audience yeah. is feeling? And that's why I'm trying to emphasize that the bystander is torn. Uh, they may come forward and say, yeah, this is terrible. And, uh, and they have to be brave because they face flack, they, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Or they retreat into a further, you know, a Khawa sort of position of, no, it's them, they deserve it, da, 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 whatever, mm. right? So that, that is it. But I, I think you have to make a distinction that this is not being done. What can, what ought to be done? I mean, is there something that... I think in a democracy it is that we, we, uh, we uh, get the bystanders uh, to, to get these other, um, uh, these other um, thoughts and ideas about what is going on, not this one single narrative. And to be able to question and to acknowledge, you know, how does one acknowledge shame? How does one acknowledge guilt? No, we don't. It's not easy. 
I, I know that in, in the clinic, I know working with individual, that that is really a very crucial threshold, you know, which either the person is able to acknowledge it, and it's really freeing when they're able to acknowledge and make reparation for whatever, mm. right? Uh, or they get into a rant about, no, they are bad, my father did this, my da 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 da, and all of that. You know, so um, so somewhere the bystander's complicity has to be highlighted, not in a blaming way, but in a in a compassionate way. Thank you, Shobna, okay. because uh, it's in, it's important to keep in mind what you said was then that we uh, we are responsible now for reaching out to the bystanders and yeah. bringing this also yes. into our conversations when we talk about Kashmir because it's not something that uh, should be just left to the experts that it, this is something where widening of conversations between people is important. Yeah. Thank you Shobna. Thank you. This Dr. was, uh, we would like to have you again uh, some other time. Uh, thank you uh, for today. If you have any feedback, any question, any comment, do write to us and keep watching News Click. Thank <laughs> you.